welcome to another episode of Dex Game Dev Spotlight. This week we're specifically focusing on video game music, and what better game to use as an example than the most talked about game out right now, Bioshock Infinite. Ascension in the count of five. Count of four. No, no. Three. Two. One. Ascension. Ascension. Just stay calm. Five thousand feet. Ten thousand feet. Fifteen thousand feet. Hallelujah. Music has always been a big part of games, and these days game soundtracks are able to improve the gameplay experience for you, the player. Technology has advanced a lot recently, and it allows for composers and game developers to work together and set the musical soundtrack in games as a key component to the overall gaming experience. This episode, we'll be investigating the key musical components of the soundtrack from Bioshock Infinite, and we'll discuss the relationship that the soundtrack has with the experience perceived by the player during the game. We'll be exploring a scene and its music from the soundtrack, and we'll take a look at how the music presents a sense of mood and atmosphere, as well as utilising tension to keep the game exciting. As you know, with every spotlight, we do try to avoid spoilers as much as possible, but when analysing the components of games, it's impossible to escape them, so be warned, if you haven't played the game, you shouldn't be watching this. Go and play it! Also, keep in mind that this game is rated MA. Now, without further ado, here's a brief synopsis of said game. Developed by Irrational, the first-person shooter adventure game Bioshock Infinite is set in the utopian-turned-dystopian floating city of Columbia, 1912. The player is placed in the shoes of the game's main protagonist, Booker DeWitt, who is given the task of travelling to Columbia and retrieving a young woman by the name of Elizabeth. This quest of sorts is complicated by the very religious city's leader, Zachary Comstock, who foresees the coming of the false shepherd, Booker, and takes precautions to ensure Elizabeth's captivity. As the game progresses, the story unfolds to reveal the city's past and the motivations behind Comstock's actions. Our unveiling of the music behind this stunning game begins with the analysis of The Songbird, written by Gary Scheiman. Similar to other music in Bioshock Infinite and music in other modern games, The Songbird is written to use tension to pull you in and keep you excited. Nobody likes playing a boring game, or worse, a boring game made even more boring by its equally boring music, which makes the whole experience kind of, well, boring. So composers try to do a good job of writing music that engages the player, and makes the whole gameplay experience a bit more exciting. To see what happens when this is done well, we'll watch a scene in the game where Booker, the player, and Elizabeth escape from the tower she is locked up in, and a gigantic, terrifying creature called Songbird tries to stop them. Now, pay attention to the music playing in this scene. Here it is. How do you know my name? Not now. Hurry! Out of the way, let me try. Which way? Here's that exact same scene, but without the music. This way! We have to keep moving! 
He's tearing the building apart. Be careful, Elizabeth. How do you know my name? Not now. Out of the way, let me try. Which way? Up! After seeing, well, hearing the difference between these two clips, it's clear that the defining component that really drives the scene and gives attention is the music. Let's explore the song and find out why. Now keep in mind this is probably going to get a bit musically technical, so for all of you out there who aren't musos, hope you can keep up. Songbird begins with a loud, deep sounding bass drum playing a syncopated 4 bar ostinato shown here. You can see that the syncopation is created from the anticipated quaver just before beat 3 of the first bar of the ostinato. This rhythm may seem slow, it's played at half tempo according to the crotchet beats in each bar, but as Catherine Schmidt Jones said in her syncopation article in 2013, music that follows the same rhythmic pattern all the time can get pretty boring. Syncopation is one way to liven things up. After a bar of rest, the rhythm of bar 3 of this ostinato is a repeat of bar 1, with an extra syncopation as seen here. This ostinato repeats twice for a total of 8 bars, after which 3 violins join in, seemingly randomly playing a continuous glissando to and from random intervals, between the notes C7 and C9. As you can see here, it's much higher than C4, or more commonly known as middle C. This randomly changing pitch gives the piece its evidently atonal feel, which when compared to tonal music, that is music with a central harmonic point, is less emotional, and it can seem a bit more engaging. As Emilia Safuge states in the Talk Classical Forum in 2011, atonal music is not often written with the purpose of expressing emotions. When you hear terror and fear, it is because you were listening to it as if you were listening to tonal music. The lack of harmonic bass can often put the listener on edge, further solidifying the tense and engaging nature of this piece, thus making the gameplay a bit more exciting. Now, in all the midst of this slip sliding around, the violins do briefly rest on the notes D and C sharp as seen here. As these notes sit very close together, only a semitone apart in fact, they sound very dissonant and harmonically and not nice at all. This dissonance helps to portray the stark terror and tension going on in the game. The next four bars consist of more thumping and screeching, but then another percussive instrument is added, a more metallic, cymbal-y sound this time. It's clear from the ostinato it plays that its rhythm is somewhat derived from the original bass drum ostinato, but adds emphasis on the first two quavers. The addition of the new layers also, little by little, racks up the tension in-game, making it even more intense. After this repeats nine times, another layer is added. The clacking sounding instrument plays an ostinato that directly contrasts with that of the bass drum. The clash of the rhythm really presents a sense of confusion and chaos. The two ostinatos look something like this. Meanwhile, the violins continue to play the random glissando notes between C7 and C9, further helping to make the piece seem quite thick and filled out, despite the number of instruments actually playing. 
Now, what's cool about this section is that not only does it mess with your head rhythmically, but it cleverly repeats whilst you're in a section of the game. As Rick Lane states in an IGN article in 2012, even the most directed games must take into account one massive variable, the player. This can include how long a player is in a particular area, transitions between peaceful and combat situations, and the choices the player can make. The repetition of certain sections in the music really helps to keep it in sync with the gameplay, so that it can always accurately portray events on screen, and give the game that extra little bit of polish and detail. When the player reaches the top of the tower, it is clear that the piece has so far built up to this point. All of the instruments, bar the violins, drop out, leaving the music suddenly thin, and the violin's dissonant sound is more focused. In the game, the tower is struck by Songbird, throwing the character off the top. As a sky rail, one of the modes of transport in the game, appears on screen, the violins play a sudden stab on the notes C sharp, D and D sharp, creating yet another spine-chilling dissonant feel. The stab also highlights the importance of the sky rail in the game, and a second stab highlights the connection between the sky rail and the hook that the player wields, also appearing on screen. The big moment, however, is when the player connects with the rail and the music bursts into a frenzy. The bass drum and metallic instrument return, this time playing a steady ostinato made up of a hit on each beat of each bar, like so. The clacking sounding instrument quadruples the tempo of the other instruments, playing a fast-paced rhythm based on semiquavers. The percussion makes up most of the section and drives the music forward, enhancing the cutscene in the game. Basically, the music makes it seem like you're going a lot faster than you actually are. This repeats for another 21 bars, after which the piece abruptly ends and the player falls off the skyline and into the water below. The experience of the music and gameplay of this scene was summed up by an avid gamer, Tom10320, in a post on Reddit in 2013. The sequence where you escape from the tower for the first time is a complete mess. You don't know what's going on, you're looking around wildly trying to work out where Songbird is, and all the while the backing track has descended into what seems like a group of people banging on pots and pans. So one second you're listening to Elizabeth's Disney Princess soundtrack, and then there's a period where the music is drowned out by Songbird crashing into things, and then there's 30 seconds of absolute panic, where you can't tell what's music and what's stuff blowing up, and then it stops. Then you can breathe out. That's a great summary of the chaos that is the first encounter with Songbird, and the music accurately portrays that tension. The scene shown in this episode is a terrific example of how music in video games can really bump up the quality of the experience and the level of detail that goes into composing music for video games is just as rich as the detail that goes into composing for a movie or even for a symphony. No expense is spared with the production of this music and it's evident that there's a lot of thought going on as to how the music can not only provide a great sensory experience whilst playing but actually enhance the gameplay. Well, that just about wraps it up for this week, folks. Hope you enjoyed this episode, and walk away with a bit more knowledge about video game music. Next week, we'll be analysing the elements of how 3D modelling is done, what needs to be considered when using complex 3D models, and how the complexity has evolved over the years. We'll be using the well-known Tomb Raider series, for example. And now to end, I present to you the gayest quartet in all of Colombia, performing God Only Knows. See you next time. Still go on, believe me. The world could show nothing to me. So, so what good would living do me? God only knows what I'd be without you. stars above you, you never need to doubt it, I'll make you 
is so sure about it. God only knows what I'd be without.